How can we give our kids and teens relief from social media pressure? That's the topic we're going to be addressing today on Flourishment. I'm your host, Tina Yeager. Flourishment is sponsored by Access More. Today I have with me John Parrott, who is the Director of Resources for Reformed Youth Ministries. He has served in student ministry for over 20 years. He's the host of the Local Youth Worker Podcast and is a frequent conference speaker. He's the author of several books, including his most recent Social Media Pressure. Welcome, John. I am so delighted to have you on the show today. This is such an important topic. Tina, thank you so much for having me on. Yes, you're right. It is very important, and I'm looking forward to, to talking with you about this. So tell me what it is that really led you to this topic. I can only imagine how much of this you've seen in social media pressure in your own ministry. Yeah, really, it's it's exactly that. Being in student ministry for over twenty years, and just watching how this has you know developed this this new technology. Um, as I've said, you know, as I started out in student ministry, I can remember when students began walking in the youth room, and they would be texting on their phones. And I was thinking, why would you text someone if you could just call them? You've got you've got a phone, and and of course um, that's. Primarily what we do now is we text over over talking. And so um, just kind of from that point to smartphones coming along to apps becoming so popular and seeing the increased concern of how this is impacting us. And as many people say, the, the, the research isn't even out there. I mean, th these haven't been around long enough to, to really see what kind of an impact uh, it's having on our, our students, but some of it we do know. And so, yeah, just being in student ministry and seeing the impact it had on students, that's what led me to, to really begin um, trying to develop this devotional for them. And from a therapist standpoint, we know that children and adults will see some neurological changes if they are focused too much on blue light wavelengths and upon those quick response, those quick reward systems that are kind of addictive, really, when you're dealing with social media likes and, and uh, you know, all of the things that are that are kind of that addictive response that we get toward being on the phone. People just can't mm -hmm. put it down. And that's true for adults and teens. What are you seeing that is specifically a problem for teenagers? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, it's really a lot of what you, what you just highlighted, but um, I think if you kind of had to, to sum it up into maybe one big thing and maybe the most concerning is just the, the screen time, um, the amount of time uh, that, that students spend on there, um, you know, as you, you talked about addiction, talked about depression, anxiety, it seems like the research has said the, the strong correlation there is the amount of time students are, are spending on their devices that, you know, as screen time goes up, depression and anxiety typically do go up. And, you know, from the um, Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, to Adam Alter's book, Irresistible, um, we've learned that so many of these devices are designed to draw us back in, um, that they do have, as you were talking about, just kind of rewards in the, in the brain and the neuroplasticity of the brain, um, just uh, forming habits for, for students. And so, yeah, I guess, again, summing it up in one thing, screen time would be kind of the, the main, maybe the big umbrella that a lot of these issues would kind of fall under. And this is a developing brain when you're talking about children and teenagers and, and the addiction and the exposure to social media is creeping backward in the age groups that it's affecting. And mm -hmm. we're also seeing due to the isolation of the recent seasons we've been through that kids are more attached to their screens. Would you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for, for sure. Um, yeah, isolation. I know that there was um, someone, I'm forgetting the author's name, but he had 10 charts that kind of sum up um, some ways in which our culture is, is shifting. And um, isolation was kind of the, the number two chart that teens are, are um, 
reporting that they have less close friends, that they are, you know, remaining in their rooms for extended periods of time, that there's a sense in which they're getting some kind of social interaction. And, and you know, I always want to pull back and say that there are some good aspects to social media that we we know it can foster a community, that um technology is a gift from God that can be utilized in different ways. And and so I don't want to just say there's no value there, but you know, as, as students um, get this kind of small taste of um, uh, community through some of uh, the social media platforms, they are sacrificing real in-person community. And so, yeah, uh, increased uh, reports of loneliness, of isolation um, that are yeah, very concerning, as you said. And in-person relationships, as we know, are not the same as online on-screen relationships. There's a dehumanization that happens and it hmm. leads to cyberbullying, comparisons, all kinds of other things. Can you talk about some of the problems of only relating to other kids online through social media contacts or video game contacts that kids make when they are playing video games in groups together? Absolutely. I mean, as you kind of talked about the incarnational relationships being together in the same, you know, physical um, space, um, th there's something about being around individuals that, you know, we all have different personalities. God's gifted us with different personalities. And when we're actually looking in someone's eyes and sharing same, the same physical space, uh, we act differently uh, than when, when it is when we're alone. And and so you're kind of blending the two when you're alone and you're engaging with someone through a social media platform. Uh, we know uh, we oftentimes don't um, say things that we would say uh, if we were in the same physical, physical space with someone, um, that we may say things more uh, candidly, um, more harshly. Um, as you talked about cyberbullying, I mean, there, there's so much that's just fostering. I mean, there's certain, you know, social media platforms that allow students to post anonymous messages without, you know, any kind of consequence for what they they say. And of course, um, some of these apps have just led to some of the harshest comments you can imagine. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, it's just, um, yeah, and, and again, going back to, as, as you're talking about the developing brain, um, it's, very concerning to think about um, that, you know, the U.S. Surgeon General just had a report recently, I guess, in the last couple of weeks. And, um, you know, it's the, the ages are getting younger with these devices of eight to 12 year olds that have smartphone that has um, various social media platforms. And you're thinking their brains are just in the middle of all this development. And how are these devices shaping them? It's it is concerning. I don't want to be an alarmist, but it is concerning for sure. And again, the U.S. Surgeon General is highlighting some of those sobering statistics. That's right. And there are solutions to this. So that's why it is good for people to look up resources like your book that allows kids to engage in healthy levels online rather than retreating into only engaging with other students and other kids online so that you don't really get that in-person contact where you learn to read social cues on facial and nonverbal you know, body language that we need to learn in order to interact with other people. And learning to be empathetic and compassionate doesn't really happen as well if you're only engaging online. So this is very important. How can people stay in touch with you and get a copy of your book that helps guides teens toward creating that balance of interacting well in person, not just online? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tina. Um, so I work for Reformed Youth Ministries and people can go to rym.org. And uh, there's all sorts of resources that we have on our website. We have student conferences as well as training for youth leaders, for parents. Uh, in reference to the book, it is currently available on Amazon. And so people can go check it out on Amazon um, as well as New Growth Press. So RYM produced this in partnership with New Growth Press. And Right now, um, New Growth is offering the book at a 30% off, and they're extending that through the month of uh, July. And so if people use the code RYM30, they can get it for 30% off. And so we definitely want to point people to New Growth Press's uh, website and uh, as well as Amazon. 
I hope that all of you listening were encouraged, inspired, and informed by this conversation with John Parrott. And I also hope that you will come back for the next episode of Flourishment. Flourishment is part of the Spark Media Network and can be found on the Edify app.